Vaccine technologies have been around uh, a long time and we're now starting to realize that there might be some new and previously unintended uses of, of vaccines, particularly for vaccines for this group of diseases we call the neglected tropical diseases, which are parasitic worm infection and other related diseases that are the most common afflictions of the world's poorest people. So our studies indicate that every single person living in extreme poverty is afflicted by at least one neglected tropical disease. And one, among their effects, are there, there are, sometimes they're killer diseases, but most are not. Most are actually cause uh, chronic disabilities. And now, working with a group of economists, we've now come to realize that these diseases actually reinforce poverty. They both occur in the setting of poverty, and there are stealth reasons why uh, the bottom billion, the world's poorest people, the 1.4 billion people in the world who live on no money can't escape poverty. So by creating vaccines for neglected tropical diseases, it's not only going to have an impact on health, but actually lift people out of poverty. And we actually call them the anti-poverty vaccines uh, on, on that basis. We've also found a very interesting link between neglected tropical diseases and conflict. So uh, many of the emerging neglected tropical diseases, such as sleeping sickness and Ebola is the same, is the same come out of the setting of conflict. So we think there's a link there as well. So vaccines are, are incredibly powerful. Um, we've, since 1990 now, we've seen a reduction in childhood deaths from 12 million children dying every year to now around 6 million children dying every year. And that mostly happened through expanded use of existing vaccines and the development of new vaccines. So there's no question vaccines are among the most uh, cost-effective and powerful life-saving technologies. Having said that, vaccines are also probably the slowest of all the biopharmaceuticals to, to develop compared to small molecule drugs or, or diagnostics or, or, or medical devices. It takes a long time to develop a, a vaccine. And so, for instance, it's not uncommon to go more than a decade from just the discovery of a new approach to making a vaccine to actually get it manufactured into a bottle of vaccine. It can then be years before the vaccine undergoes clinical testing. And then it turns out we just do the easy, we've just finished the easy part because uh, unless a vaccine is uh, made accessible to the people who need them, it just sits there on the shelf, it doesn't have much of an impact. So even after, for instance, licensure of the hepatitis B vaccine, it was more than 20 years before it was widely disseminated. And we're gonna see that again, unfortunately, through the new cervical cancer vaccine. So what we need to do is be innovative in figuring out how to reduce the time frame from each step, from discovery to actually making the vaccine, from doing the clinical testing of the vaccine, and then providing the global access for the vaccine. So there are a number of things we can do to, sh to potentially uh, shorten their, those time frames. So in terms of uh, developing uh, the vaccine, one of the things that we try to do at the Sabin Vaccine Institute is to build in low-cost processes into our vaccines from the very beginning. So for instance, our vaccines that we're making for neglected tropical diseases will only target the world's poor. So if we make a $300 vaccine, it's not of much good to anybody because it'll never uh, be used. So we try to build into our technologies low-cost approaches uh, using low-cost expression vectors, low-cost column resins to purify the vaccines. Uh, and that, that's an important uh, first step. Then we try to be very innovative in our clinical trial design. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in shortening that time frame. So for instance, with the Ebola vaccine that's now being rolled out, if we take, go through the usual steps and go through five or six years, it won't have, the vaccine won't be of any use for this current Ebola epidemic. So we have to have a lot of innovation in terms of getting uh, the, the vaccine through an accelerated uh, clinical development time frame. And finally, uh, in terms of global access, once the vaccine is licensed, we need innovative strategies like, for instance, our sustainable immunization financing strategy, where we work with governments to learn how to procure, procure and uh, get the vaccines to the people who need them. There are, a few, there are a few success stories that I think we can look to for lessons learned. 
Uh, and then there are a few uh, disaster stories as well. I think one of the unfortunate stories is with the uh, HPV vaccine. Fantastic vaccine, highly effective, innovative technology, but it's costing $420 to finish the full immunization series. So what you have are more than 20,000 uh, women who die of cervical cancer uh, every year, and that's a vaccine-preventable disease. And so if you wait 10 years for the cost to come down, when you do the math, that's 10 times 20,000, that's 200,000 uh, women. Most of them tend to be younger women in Latin America who get cervical cancer because they don't have access to routine pap smear screening. And so it's not just 200,000 uh, women, it's 200,000 families uh, that are destroyed. So we need to do better. I think we've seen some success stories. An example is what the Serum Institute of India has done with the meningococcal A vaccine, which is to get a developing country manufacturer involved and then to rapidly scale and, and disseminate. That, that's, that's a great story. We need more of those success stories. Um, uh, I think the fact that the Ebola vaccines that we have out there, that technology has been around more than a decade and sat there on the shelf. Albert Sabin once said, a scientist who is also a human being cannot rest while a life-saving technology sits there on the shelf, this is a, this is a good example. Well, for Ebola vaccine, now things are different because it's all hands on deck. Uh, the U.S. Congress is frightened enough, the Europeans are frightened enough, and now you'll see uh, this massive investment. And that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, it's just that it, to me, it looks like a little kid's soccer game where all the little kids go running after the ball and then the ball moves somewhere else and they all run after that. There's no, there's no strategic planning. So what I'd like to see for the, that what's happening with the Ebola vaccine is it for it to extend to all 17 neglected tropical diseases. That we don't look at Ebola as a one-off entity because we have the same market failure uh, and market forces affecting Ebola that we have for all the neglected tropical diseases. I think one of the uh, aspects of neglected tropical diseases that people don't appreciate is it's, it's not a problem only over there. Uh, by that, I mean they, people think of it as a strictly problem of the most destitute countries in sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa. Yes, they are important problems there, but what we're finding more and more is uh, these diseases are occurring among the poor who live in wealthy countries. Uh, and it's a concept that I've named Blue Marble Health. And it refers to the fact that if you look at the poor living in G20 countries, such as China, uh, India, Indonesia, Mexico, Argentina, all G20 countries, they actually somewhat paradoxically account for the lion's share of the world's neglected tropical diseases. So it's no longer developing versus developed. It's the poor living among the wealthy. And even in the United States and Europe, we find a cohort of extremely poor people with widespread neglected tropical diseases. And, and we need to figure out a way to develop innovation across, across that, that new concept of blue marble.